Hello, everybody. Am I working now? Happy Monday to you all. You guys able to hear me? The internet's been a little funky here this morning at the school. Okay, cool. Nice. Excellent. How's everybody doing today? Bit tired? Yeah. It's a Monday, that's for sure. Well, hopefully today's enthralling lecture on history will wake you guys up. I think that we're in for a really good one today. We did uh, we did this in the in the first period, um, and it uh, it went it went really well. So I'm I'm excited about it. To be honest, I look forward to this lecture every year because I love the stuff that we're doing today. I think the late Middle Ages are super super interesting. So I'm I'm really excited to like share some of this stuff with you today. We still got a couple minutes and we only have six people in here. So I'm going to wait until we get a couple more people in here. Sorry, I've, I've been eating these Belveda crackers. I have a bunch of like crumbs in my teeth right now. But anyhow, um, <clears throat> Seth, welcome. Buenos dias. Morgan, hello. This is the best part. You guys coming in and saying hello. Nobody said hello last class. I had to like beg them to say anything in the chat. You guys are a little tired today. That's all right. It happens. Teddy, Caitlin, hello. Welcome. Nicole, hello. Got 11 people in here now. Theodore, hello. Good to see you. Nihal, very good to see you as well. Or Nahal, if I'm if I said it wrong, I apologize. Hello there. So good to see you all. Hey, how about this? I'm excited for you guys to get in the classroom so I can actually put a face to the name because I don't really and I know I could be doing Zoom and stuff like that, but frankly, I've been doing Zoom for um, I teach AP research an AP seminar and they're slightly smaller classes. So um, I've been doing Zoom for those ones because I require, I need it for that. For this one, it's it's very lecture based and I don't need to be seeing you or anything, but a lot of times people don't even have their cameras on or anything like that anyway. So um, there's just no need to do Zoom for this class. But um, there was that video put up by Dr. Goins this morning. So hopefully your first period teacher um, uh, sent that to you because he did ask us in first period to share that with you. Um, you guys and your emojis. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day where you guys come into class and I'll be able to lecture in person with you again, even if I have to have a mask on. That's all right. So it hides my ugly face. Now let's move forward. Uh, here's what we're going to be doing with uh, the lecture today. We're going to be largely looking at, for the first part of class, a, you guys, I tell you what, you guys are so silly. All right. Um, so um, we got 14 people in here right now. And, um, and so we're going to go ahead and get started because it is now 9.09 and class starts at 9.08. So let's begin. Um, the first thing that I'm going to have you guys do is I want you to go to Canvas, open up, um, what is it? It's the files uh, tab. 
on Canvas. And then within the Files tab on Canvas under AP Euro, you will see a file called wmmanchester.pdf. I want you to open that up. I apologize that it's not like the greatest resolution file, but it's still readable. You shall, still should be able to follow along here. And uh, hello there, Joseph. Thanks so much for uh, joining us this morning. Uh, so if, you, if you're if you just coming in right now, go over to the file section on Canvas and open up the thing that says WM, meaning William, Manchester.pdf. Now, in case you're wondering, who is William Manchester? Well, William Manchester is just a historian. He's a guy. And he's not from... Um, He's not from the late Middle Ages. He wrote a book on the late Middle Ages, and I have the book right here. It's called, uh, you can see my very well-worn copy that I've read many, many times of A World Lit Only by Fire by William Manchester. And what we're going to be doing today is reading not this whole book. I could have assigned this as, an, as a summer assignment, my first year Euro. I actually did do that, um, but it ended up being more of a headache. And there's really only a couple of major takeaways that I want to use from this book from the very beginning of it to start to um, make uh, a little bit better sense of what it was like for someone who lived in the late Middle Ages. Now, I want to emphasize a couple of different things as we get started talking about this today. First of all, in this class, what you're going to find is that we go over a whole lot of textual documents. And the reason for that is because you know, the content, I do, I do lecture on content, and we're going to be doing some lecture on content in the latter part of class today. But really, the way that AP Euro is designed is that you're learning kind of the nuts and bolts content when you're doing your reading, when you're doing your reading guides and you're answering those key questions. By the way, I'd like to mention too, I handmade every single one of the reading guides that you're going to use this semester. I didn't rip them off from other teachers. I didn't steal them from the internet. I made them myself after reading the textbook and you should be the one to read the textbook and answer them as well. And so um, I take great pride in those reading guides because, number one, they took a really, really long time to make. And number two, um, I think that they're really good. I think that they're good key questions for you. But when we use time in class, when I actually have time to directly instruct, I don't want to be just lecturing on stuff that you already read about the entire time. Okay. I want to use the time to help you to develop skills because so much of this test is about your thinking abilities. It's not just about memorizing facts. It's about being able to look at things with a discerning eye. So as we go over documents in this class, there's a couple of ground uh, groundwork fundamental things that you should probably think of. Number one, every time I present something to you, including this book today, I want you to be thinking about it as almost like um, almost like a little artifact that you collect throughout the class and you have like a little knapsack. OK, like if for those of you that are like Dungeons and Dragons players, right, when you go out on a quest or if you play like RPG video games like Skyrim or whatever, and you go out and you like loot a treasure bin or something like that and you throw the loot into your knapsack. Think about everything that I give you here is almost kind of like loot and you're taking it and you're kind of storing it away that way. When you need it in the future, you'll be able to take it out and say, OK, look, I've got this piece of evidence that I can use to support my argument, because that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to create a collection of evidence in your brains that you can pull from to say, I read something about this one time and I know an example of this, like when I read whatever, you know, William Manchester's uh, A World Lit Only by Fire. I remember some of the evidence he used and I'm going to now use some of that evidence as, as my own. OK, great. The other thing is that you want to be able to do in this class is to be able to discern between two types of resources. And you've probably heard about the differences between primary resources and secondary resources, all right, in history. A primary uh, source document is a document that typically is an artifact that came from the time. And that artifact could be something like um, a journal entry. It could be, um, it could be, uh, it could be a physical thing even. It could be a grave or a person's remains, or it could be um, some sort of book that was um, written at the time or something like that. All right, it's usually um, coming straight from the horse's mouth. And what I mean by that, that's an old school phrase. That's an old school. I grew up in Minnesota. My grandma used to use a, a bunch of old school phrases. When it's when we say something comes straight from the horse's mouth, what we mean is that the source that we're looking at came from the time. 
that we're using that source as a piece of evidence from that time to build an argument, all right? But, all right, the important thing about that is that when you're looking at any source, whether it's a primary or secondary resource, you're looking at it, reading it against the grain. And I think I mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. When we're reading things in this class, we don't wanna just be passively reading it. Every time we read something, we want to be utilizing some critical thinking skills to ask ourselves questions as we're reading it. Do I believe what I'm reading? What kinds of biases am I reading? Where's this reading going to go next? You start to make predictions about the text that you're reading and so on and so forth. So primary resource documents and secondary resource documents will require you to look at things with a very discerning eye, to read between the lines, to decipher what it is that's being told to you in a brand new way. And that's really the skill content of the class. And these are the skills that we need to be able to build because remember that one part of the exam is literally a document-based question. If you don't understand how to properly read the documents, there's going to be no possible way for you be, to be able to construct a valid historical doc, uh, argument from those documents. So um, let's talk a little bit about secondary sources. This secondary source here is written after the fact. Now, a secondary resource is usually put out by some kind of um, historian, maybe a journalist, okay, who's writing about something um, to try to give the reader an idea of what happened. Um, but they're also usually going to be making some kind of argument. So one of the first things that I'm going to be asking you to do as we get into reading this today, and you're going to go ahead and read along with me. Um, as, as we go through this together to kind of give you just a little bit of an example of the kinds of things that you should be doing as you read these documents is the first thing that I'm going to ask you to do is to determine what's the major historical claim that William Manchester is making in this in this book here. What's his main argument that he is that he's making. All right. And, and then be thinking about what kinds of pieces of evidence does he use to substantiate that argument? Remember that an argument will fall flat on its face, just the same way an opinion will, if it's not substantiated by some sort of evidence, okay? Some sort of, of um, uh, uh, you know, it's like the, the meat and potatoes of the whole point that you're trying to make, all right? It's not gonna, you're gonna have a, a light fluffy argument if you're not able to provide that argument with some, with some substance, with some substantiation, with some evidence, right? So I want you to be thinking too about the evidence that William Manchester uses as he goes through and, and we start reading this. So let's pull that up right now. I'm gonna pull it up on my screen and you can pull it up on yours. Actually, uh, yeah, well, uh, you know what I'm gonna do? I actually have a printout of it right here. So I'm just gonna use the excerpts that that, uh, that, I, that I selected from this book. So we're gonna be starting here. I don't know if you can see this particularly well. We're gonna be starting right there where it says, was the medieval world a civilization? Okay, all right. All right, so here we go. Was the, follow along, be listening carefully. I'm gonna try and read this in nice engaging fashion so that you're able to follow along. And again, be thinking about the claim and the evidence that he's gonna be using here. Was the medieval world a civilization comparable to Rome before it or to the modern era which followed? Okay, so we're talking about the medieval world, this time, this period of time that's situated between the fall of the Roman Empire and what we now consider a more modern period. Okay, he goes on to say, <coughs> excuse me, he goes on to say, if by civilization, one means a society which has reached a relatively high level of cultural and technological development. The answer is no. During the Roman millennium, meaning roughly the thousand years that the Roman Empire lasted, imperial authorities had controlled the destinies of all the lands within the empire, from the Atlantic in the west to the Caspian Sea in the east, from the Antonine Wall in northern Britain to the upper Nile Valley in the south. Enlightened Romans had served as teachers, lawgivers, builders, administrators. Romans had reached towering pinnacles of artistic and intellectual development. Their city had become the physical and spiritual capital of the Roman Catholic Church. The age which succeeded it, the one that we are now concerned with learning about, the late Middle Ages, 
the, the, the medieval times, sometimes referred to as the Dark Ages. And I want you to be thinking about the title, the book of the book, A World Lit Only by Fire. A world lit only by fire. This is not only a reference to the fact that obviously they didn't have electricity. Electricity wouldn't come about for another several hundreds of years afterwards. Okay, we're not literally, it's not a book about, you know, literally walking around and, and with a torch, okay, and lighting your surroundings. Naturally, people did do that back in the time, but that's not what this book is about. It's about a bigger idea, right? It's about a world lit only by fire. What kinds of implications does that have? Why would he title the book A World Lit Only by Fire? What kinds of implications? Well, it's a world that's kind of dark, right? It's the it's a world that he's trying to set up for you to say this is kind of a dark period of time in history. And it lasts for a really long time. The dark ages go on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, all right? During the dominance of the Roman Catholic Church after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, so let's see. He says, the age which succeeded it accomplished none of these feats that the Romans did. Trade on the Mediterranean, which was once a Roman lake, was now perilous, dangerous. Vandal pirates and then Muslim pirates lay athwart the vital sea routes. Agriculture and transport were inefficient. The population was never fed adequately. A barter economy yielded to coinage. A barter is like a trade economy where you're trading like goods and services rather than using coins and money to buy things. Um, a barter economy yielded to coinage only because the dominant lords enriched by plunder and conquest needed some form of currency to pay for wars, ransoms, their departure on crusades, the knighting of their sons and their daughter's marriages. And the reason that they would have to save money for their daughter's marriages is because back in the olden times, um, if you had a daughter, your daughter didn't have any inheritance rights. And the best uh, opportunity for, for a woman at that time uh, was to get married to somebody of an equal economic status to your family. But the only way that they could get married is by um, the father of the potential bride daughter, okay, uh, to provide what was known as a dowry. And this dowry was a sum of money or wealth that was given along with his daughter uh, to the family as a like, um, you know, she's in your family now and it's your responsibility to take care of her. Here's the wealth that we will provide for her. But after this, that's all you get from our family sort of a thing. OK, um, <clears throat> let's see here. Moving on. Uh, Royal Treasury officials were so deficient in elementary skills that they were dependent upon arithmetic learned from the Arabs. And what we're going to find is that the Middle East, and particularly the Ottoman Empire, plays a significant role in, in, in contributing to the start of the Renaissance in Europe. We'll learn more about that in a little bit. The name exchequer emerged because they used to use a checkered cloth as a kind of abacus, which is an old school calculator, in doing sums. Um, if their society was diverse and colorful, it was also anarchic, formless, and appallingly unjust. So I'm going to stop after that second paragraph now, and I'd like you to type in the chat, what is the major claim, the historical argument that William Manchester is making here? One. And then two, what are some pieces of evidence already that he's kind of outlined for you in the beginning of this, of this reading, in the first couple of paragraphs, what we might consider the introduction of the book? What kinds of pieces of evidence is he using um, general ideas to support the idea that the Dark Ages were a period of time uh, uh, that he's making. the I don't want to give away the answer for his argument. So what is he saying about the medieval times? And then what is the evidence he's using? Go ahead, type that in the chat. I'll be right back. I'm going to fill up my uh, cup with water. I'm getting thirsty.
Really? Only one response? Come on, guys. I need more than that. What's the main argument that William Manchester is making? And what are some pieces of evidence that he's using to support it? Okay, good. Mass discord um, among the nations. Remember, it's not really, it's not quite nations yet. We're still in a period of time where things are realms, but I get, I get your meaning on that. But remember that we're dealing with like kingdoms right now. It's not quite nation states yet. If their society was diverse and colorful, yes, it was formless, appallingly unjust, good. Um, that's a quote from the book. Let's try and so that's like using some evidence. All right. What are some other pieces of evidence? The claim is that uh, the Middle Ages did not accomplish very much and that the Romans did more and that it was a lawless time. Good. Nice. Nice. All right. Good job, Morgan. Didn't have a good structural civilization. Nice job, Nicole. Society was not properly structured and organized. Okay, good. Good. Yeah. Okay. The Dark Ages was not advanced as the Roman Empire before it. Okay, good. Good. Nice. All right. Good. So remember what he says about the Roman Empire. They have these pinnacles of achievement, huge, huge, huge structures, right? I'm sure you've seen the image of the Colosseum, these ancient Roman ruins. They had massive buildings, massive societies. The empire was centralized. They controlled all of the land within the empire. It was a massive territory governed by a centralized government. The, the, the Middle Ages did not have that. Trade on the Mediterranean. Great job, Theodore. That's some excellent evidence that he uses there. Yes. Okay, trade on the Mediterranean was dangerous now. Previously, trade was dominated by the Roman Empire on the Mediterranean Sea. No one would have challenged the Roman Empire. Nowadays, it's scary. There's pirates out there and dangerous folks. Okay, he's making the argument that the Dark Ages were terrible. He gives the example showing the area Roman Empire succeeded in a whole lot. Good, 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 good. You guys are doing a really nice job with this. I love that. Thank you so much for all these responses. All right. We're going to keep moving forward now. So I'm starting with nevertheless. It says uh, just right where we left off. Nevertheless, it possessed its own structure, meaning the Rome, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, late Middle Ages possessed its own structure and peculiar institutions, which evolved almost imperceptibly over the centuries, meaning that we're in this time where over the centuries, things develop very, very, very slowly. It's almost as though time slows down, okay? Medievalism, medievalism was born in the decaying ruins of a senile and impotent empire. He's talking about the, he's talking about the, the Roman Empire, which had become this decaying empire. It died just as Europe was emerging as a distinctive cultural unit. And he goes on and he says that word interregnum. The interregnum was the worst of times. And, and what he's referring to when he says interregnum in this period of time is the time between two civilized societies. He is really making the argument that the Dark Ages, this world lit only by fire during medieval times, during the late Middle Ages, okay, was a period of time of perpetual darkness, not physically dark, I guess somewhat physically dark because they didn't have lights and stuff like that. But he's not talking about the physical darkness. He's talking about more of an intellectual darkness. He's talking about a societal dark, darkness, okay, where, where a whole lot of people are functioning in Europe in kind of this motionless blur where there's very, very little development for a very long time. In this entire period, we're really the only structure that brings any degree of um, uniformity amongst all of Europe is this idea of, of the Roman Catholic Church. People are bound together by this societal structure that's dominated by the Roman Catholic Church for nearly a thousand years. OK, so this period of time he refers to as the interregnum, but he's not talking about it in like a kingly sense. He's talking about it as, a, as an entire period of history that's kind of situated between two far more civilized um, uh, uh, periods of time. OK, so he says the interregnum and it goes on to the next page that you can scroll down was the worst of times for the imaginative, the cerebral and the unfortunate. 
meaning if you had any sorts of ailments or, um, you know, um, you know, deficiencies in any sort of way, um, you know, maybe you just weren't particularly attractive. Maybe you didn't, maybe you had, um, you know, whatever sorts of, uh, of like, you know, um, gen- congenital defects or something like that. People were tra- treated really, really cruelly back in those days. There was no idea of like this individual dignity that people hold today, kind of regardless of whatever you look like or wherever you come from. And these days we encourage people to be thinking, cerebral. That's what think that the very, very thoughtful, okay, imaginative. We, we encourage creativity in our modern times, okay? But in these days, not so. Um, the healthy, the shrewd, the handsome and the beautiful and the lucky flourished. Okay. So we're talking about a period of time. That's a pretty dog eat dog sort of society. Europe was ruled by a new aristocracy, this aristocratic noble class that, that, um, that held land and political power and wealth. Okay. And ultimately the regal. And when we say regal, that just refers to a king. So nobles and kings are really the the leaders of the day. After the barbarian tribes had overwhelmed the Roman Empire, men had established themselves as members of this new aristocratic privileged class in various ways. Any leader with a large following of free men was eligible to become a noble, though some had greater followings and therefore greater claims than others. In Italy, some members of the Roman senatorial families Uh, became nobles, survivors who had married with the Goths or Huns, intermarried with the local tribes. Um, As Ovid had observed, a barbarian was suitable to marry if he was rich. Uh, Others in the patriciate, the upper echelons of society, the noble class, which only made up, remember, less than like 1% of society, uh, were landowners whose huge domains were worked by slaves and protected by private armies. Uh, In England and France, the privileged might be descendants of Anglo Saxon, Frank, Vandal, or Ostrogoth chieftains. Many German hierarchs belong to the very old families, revered since time immemorial, and therefore acceptable to the other princes who had to approve each ennoblement. Because this was a time of incessant warfare, however, most noblemen had, ris- uh, had risen by disting- distinguishing themselves in battle. In the early centuries, distinction ended with the death of the man who had won it. Uh, But patrilineal descent, so in other words, if you became a noble and you died, that noble title in the early, early days would die with you. However, increasingly as time goes on, those noble titles start to be passed on to the eldest son. We talked a little bit about that last week with that term primogeniture. Um, And so this started to create dynasties amongst nobles and also amongst kings. Titles began to evolve. Duke, Earl, Count, Baron, okay, Margrave, all of these ideas or marquee, um, serving them on the lowest rung. I'm kind of skipping down, paraphrasing this next paragraph a little bit. Serving the lowest rung of the aristocratic ladder was the knight. Okay. Um, originally, the word meant a farm worker of free birth, but by the 11th century, the thousands, okay, uh, knights were cavalrymen living in fortified mansions with noble seals. All were guided, in theory at least, by this idealistic knightly code <coughs> and bound to serve bound by oath to serve a noble of some uh, sort or a king. Okay, so um, that kind of concludes that next section, talks a little bit. So if we were talking Persia categories here, okay, let's let's integrate another skill. If we're talking Persia categories, what kinds of, per, what, what Persia categories, what angles, okay, uh, historical angles is William Manchester approaching uh, the, his, his historical argument with? Think Persia. Political, economic, social, religious, uh, intellectual, artistic. You just type it right in the chat. It might be more than one. But what would you say is maybe the most important? Social? Good. Yeah. There's a lot of social in this. What makes it social? He talks about some art too, doesn't he? Particularly the architecture from the Romans and comparing it Yeah, good. He talks political. 
Yeah, he talks political because he's talking about who's making decisions at that time, right? The aristocrats. Aristocrats could be, it depends on how you're talking about them, right? Because aristocrats could be social because we're talking about a social class, but aristocrats could be political too because they're the only ones who hold any political authority at that time, right? Yeah, good. Nice. Okay, so you guys are starting to see some of this here. And you'll see too, he goes into some other ones. He even talks a little bit about economic as we move into the next part here. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for contributing. The next part, I'm going to move on to page 21 here. Okay, we're on page 21. And I'm going to start about halfway down the page after that little marker right there where it says the most baffling. Okay, so that's where we're starting next. So you can follow along on your uh, computer at home. So he goes on to say the most baffling, elusive, yet in many ways the most significant dimension of the medieval mind were invisible and silent. Now, I want to point something out that he's doing here, okay? I want to point something out that he's doing. One of the things that good writers do, and one of the skills that I'm going to ask you guys to develop in this class, is, you you know, writing is not just this thing that you do to put words together, to string sentence together in some sort of random format. Writing is actually very, very organized. And what good writers will do is with a new paragraph, like we're starting with right now, they start their paragraphs with something called a topic sentence. And what this topic sentence does is it's just a sentence that gives the reader a general idea of what that entire paragraph is roughly going to be talking about. Okay, you're gonna, excuse me, you're gonna notice that as he goes through this paragraph, he, he everything that he talks about in this paragraph is gonna be, is gonna relate back to this major topic that he's talking about. So I want to read that one more time. The most baffling, elusive, which is kind of like difficult to understand, right? Yet in many ways, the most significant dimensions of the medieval mind were invisible and silent. So we're getting into understanding the medieval mind. Now, we're largely talking about in this paragraph, the the medieval male mind. And the reason for that is not because I'm trying to be sexist or because William Manchester is trying to be sexist. It's because remember what I told you last week, which is that the medieval era was a, and really all the way up through much of the class was a very patriarchal era, an era where it was a male dominated society. And this was a belief that was held by everyone at that time. The thing that makes words like racism and sexism um, difficult to understand in the context of history is that um, from the modern day perspective, where we understand the notions and we have words to describe phenomena that happen, they didn't have those words to describe it back in those days because in their time, that was just the way the world was. There was no language to describe sexism because whether you were a man or a woman in that time, women being treated differently on the basis of being a woman was practiced by everyone and believed by the core of their being to be the way that things were, okay? So there really is no sexism in this time, despite the fact that from your modern day time, you would look back at those times and say, man, that's really, really, really sexist, okay? It's really unfair to women that they had such a lower stature in society compared to males, not just in the upper echelons of society, where we see noble males who have all of the land titles and all of the wealth and all of the property rights and all of the legal status. Okay, women literally didn't even have individual legal status back in these days, all right? They essentially became um, uh, legally under the authority of their husbands. I mean, um, young ladies in the class, if you imagine down the line when you get older getting married and then like losing your individual identity and, 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 and somehow now your identity is subservient to your husband. That's how the world worked back in those days. And to us, of course, this seems preposterous in modern times. But in those times, that's just the way that the world was, which is, again, almost difficult for us to, to understand. So what we're getting into right now is to break apart the medieval mind, the personality, the identity, if there is even one of these people who existed in the late Middle Ages. And I want you to listen very carefully to this section here because I think it's going to be pretty mind-boggling to you, okay? He goes, uh, 
One of these dimensions of the medieval mind uh, was the medieval man's total lack of ego. Now, when William Manchester uses this word ego, he's referring to like, if you've ever heard the word ego before, it's actually a phrase that refers to the very, very early days of the study of psychology. Um, there was a there was a uh, psycho a Austrian physician, a psychologist by the name of Sigmund Freud, and he came up with this idea of analyzing the human or the man's uh, personality. Even in Freud's time, the world was still pretty sexist. Okay, and that was in the early 1900s. A lot of this has changed pretty recently, actually. So when we talk about the medieval man's total lack of ego. When you hear that word ego, or if you call somebody egotistical, or, oh, so-and-so can't get over their ego, or whatever it is, what we're talking about is an individual identity of a person, okay? And in Freud's theory, he says that the ego is something that we need to protect. It's the conscious understanding of our identity, of who we are, okay, as individuals on the planet. But what William Manchester is saying here is that the medieval man had a total lack of ego, so what he's implying is that the medieval man really didn't have a sense of self, which is hard to understand from our modern context. Think about not having a sense of self. It's, it's almost impossible in, a, in particularly America, where we're very, very individualistic, where people are constantly trying to exert the self. And I don't even have to bring up the word selfie, okay? Think about it. Think about all the countless photographs you've taken of yourself to post on your whatever, TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, www.findmeafriend.com, or whatever it is that you post pictures on these days because I'm old. Okay, selfies. Selfies are like the, the 21st century embodiment of egotism, bordering on narcissism, okay? Write MySpace, please. No one's used MySpace for over two decades now. Okay. So, um, why, you know, like, uh, are you trolling me with MySpace or is that coming back? Who, I, who knows? Okay. I'm too old for any of that. Okay. So, the point is to say here, all right, you know, do you really, Kai, you use MySpace? Is that a thing that people use still? All right. I had no idea MySpace was even around. I thought it died off years ago. Okay, here we go. Um, so moving forward, think about this for a second. It's almost hard to wrap your brain around, okay? Um, <laughs> um, so not having an identity, right? Not having any sense of self or, or ego, okay? People these days strive to exert their ego in so many fashions. Um, but in this time, that just really isn't the case. So let's keep reading. Even people with creative powers had no sense of self. Each of the great soaring medieval cathedrals, our most treasured legacy from that age, required three or four centuries to complete, meaning that over the course of that time, no one person was going to be, you know, if we think about the, the Mona Lisa, Okay, Mona Lisa by Leonardo da Vinci, right? The Mona Lisa, it, it's like you just attribute the Mona Lisa to da Vinci, okay? Or any number of great works of art to the, to the creator of that piece. None of that existed in this time, okay? Um, Canterbury Cathedral, which is in Southern England, was 23 generations in the making. Uh, in France, there's a, the uh, a cathedral called Chartres Cathedral, which is um, a former Druidic center. That took 18 generations to build. Yet we know nothing of the architects or builders. Why? Because they weren't living for themselves. So if they weren't living for themselves, why were... Why did, why is, what is the argument that William Manchester is making here about why the medieval man did not really even possess an ego, a sense of self? Make a prediction.
Anyone got a prediction for why the medieval man really had no sense of self? Daniel, Daniel, excellent, excellent answer. He writes that because in the Middle Ages, much of, love, of the life was comprised of religion or something related to that, 100% accurate. These folks live in a Christian, Roman Catholic church dominated society. The reason they have very little sense of self is because to put yourself into the medieval man's mind, you have to understand where the medieval man is coming from and the context of his history, the discourse, as I've used that word before, the historical discourse of a medieval man is because people did not live for themselves. They did not live for this life. Their earthly experience was unimportant to them. There was one thing that mattered and one thing alone that mattered to them. And that was eternal salvation in the afterlife. They cared about getting into heaven. Their role on this earth was meaningless to them, okay? The reason they built these soaring, massive cathedrals during this time was not for recognition of being an amazing architect. It was not for recognition or becoming famous as an artist. It was because you were building something that you thought was your ticket into heaven, okay? And these cathedrals have massive spires that go straight up to the sky, okay? Why? They're trying to get the building as close to heaven as they can, all right? The buildings are built a lot of times, cathedrals are built literally in the shape of a cross, okay? And there are different parts of the church, and they're organized in a particular way, coherent with the religion, all right? So they are living for the afterlife, not for this life, all right? Um uh, to, they were glorifying God. To them, their identity in this life was irrelevant. Noblemen had surnames, if you were wealthy and noble, but there, fewer than 1% of the souls in Christendom, Christendom is just a fancy word for all of Christian medieval Europe at that time. Fewer than 1% of the souls in Christendom were well-born. Typically the rest, which made up about 60 million Europeans, were known as Hans, Jacques, Sal, Carlos, Will, Will's wife, Will's son, which is where we get the surname down the line. Eventually, it evolves into Wilson or John's son, Johnson. Okay, that's where we get those surnames. Or even Will's daughter, particularly in Germanic and and, um, and uh, Scandinavian countries, they would name their, their daughter after their father as well. So it would be like Magnus daughter, okay, or something like that. Um, if, ha if that was inaccurate or inadequate or confusing, a nickname would do. Because most peasants lived and died without leaving their birthplace, there was very seldom uh, a need for any tag beyond one eye, Rusi, meaning redhead, Bionda, Blondie, or something like that. Uh, their villages were frequently innominate, meaning without a name, for the same reason. If war took a man even a short distance from a nameless hamlet, the chances of his returning to it were slight. He could not identify it, and finding his way back alone was virtually impossible. I'm now at the top of page 22, if you're following along. Each hamlet was inbred, isolated, unaware of the world beyond the most familiar local landmark. Maybe it was a creek or a mill or a tall tree scarred by lightning. There were no newspapers or magazines to inform the common people of great events, even if there were. Keep in mind, most of them were illiterate. They wouldn't have been able to read them. Okay, occasional pamphlets might reach them, but then those pamphlets would have been usually theological, meaning religious in nature. And just like the Bible, they were always published in Latin, a language they no longer understood. Between 1378 and 1417, now we're going to start getting into a little bit of the content that you read about for last week. Popes Clement VII and Benedict XIII reigned in Avignon. Avignon is a city in southern France, and you might have read about something called the Avignon Papacy. This was a giant schism in the church in the late 1300s, where literally there was a pope in Rome, and then there was what they call an anti-pope in Avignon. And each of them claimed to be the rightful um, uh, spiritual leaders 
of the Roman Catholic Church, and each of them excommunicated one another. Okay, uh, so and and Rome had various popes during this time too: Urban the Sixth, Boniface the Ninth, Innocent the Seventh, Gregory the Twelfth, and each of those ones excommunicated them right back. But on the other hand, the toiling peasantry, which made up ninety plus percent of the society was unaware of this estrangement in the church. They didn't live for the most part in Rome. They didn't live for the most part in Avignon. They were scattered across this giant continent, many of them living in nameless little hamlets, not even towns, okay, just hamlets, shires in the middle of nowhere or in the middle of the forest. They had no communication with anywhere that was even a few miles away from the uh, boundaries of their tiny little village that they lived in, okay? Um, and, and why would they have known anything about it? They didn't have any interest in what was going on outside of their little local town or village that they lived in. Who would have even told them? The village priest knew nothing himself. His archbishop, the guy that was above him in the ranks of the Roman Catholic Church, had every reason to keep this giant schism quiet. Why would you tell your local priests about a giant problem going on in the church, even if you were aware of it, it would only create confusion and chaos in the countryside. They had to squelch this information, keep it quiet. They didn't want it getting out that the, there was a giant schism in the church. Okay. Um, the folk were baptized, shriven, attended mass, received the host at communion, married, and received the last rites, never dreaming that they should be informed about great events, let alone have any voice in them. And again, think about how different this is from modern times. Guys, you can get on your phone, onto Twitter, onto Instagram, onto whatever news site, okay? And you have information at your fingertips within seconds. Sometimes you're getting info you didn't even ask for, right? We could know about something that happened on the other side of the planet within moments of it happening, okay? There was nothing like this, nothing like this that existed in this time, all right? And what he says next is, is interesting too. He goes, um, without ever being, okay, so with never dreaming that they should be informed about great events, let alone have any voice in them. Think about today, people can't go five seconds without making a comment about something. You know, and this is where on the line, particularly amongst adults, probably not so much amongst your age group, but amongst adults, everything that diverts into a political argument or this and that, people always have an opinion to express about everything. Okay, they, they, it's like everybody talks about everything these days. All right. Um, they didn't. They just simply didn't. They didn't think that they even had a say to talk about anything, much less had any idea of anything that was going on. Their anonymity anonymous, they're anonymous, okay, their anonymity approached the absolute, so did their mute acceptance of it, meaning they didn't argue it. In this time, there's no understanding of like, it's my role to question, it's my role to criticize, it's my role to comment. There was nothing like that, all right? In later ages, when identities eventually became necessary, their descendants would either adopt the last name of the local lord that they lived under, which was also a custom that was taken by uh, American slaves uh, after their emancipation in the 1860s, after the Civil War here in the United States, or they would even take the name of an occupation, which is where we get some of the last names that folks still even have today, like Miller or Taylor or Smith. These are all names of, um, of professions that people were involved in. Even then, they were casual in spelling it, and he kind of talks about how spelling was not universalized at that time. And among the implications of this lack of selfhood was an almost total indifference to privacy, as in the summertime, peasants frequently went about naked. In the medieval mind, there was also no awareness of time, which is even more difficult to grasp. Notice once again what he did here. He set it up with a topic sentence. So you know that everything in this next paragraph that we're going to be reading about is going to somehow be relating to conceptualization of time, which is, again, I have to, I'm trying right now to pick you out of the stream in 2020, your historical discourse. If we talk of history as though it's this giant flowing river that's been flowing for the last however many thousands of years, I'm trying to pull you out of where you are in the river and drop you down back in the 1300s, in this medieval dark era, all right? 
In the medieval mind, there was also no awareness of time, which is even more difficult, difficult to grasp. Inhabitants of the 20th century, which is when this was written, because this was written about 1991, even though um, a lot of it is still applicable today. So even inhabitants of the 21st century are instinctively aware at any moment of past, present, and future. Most can quickly identify where you are on that temporal scale, the year, the day of the, or date of the week. And frequently, if you back in the 90s, look at your wristwatch, you can tell what time it is. These days, look at your phone, look at your computer, your microwave, whatever you have in your house that has a clock on it, all right? Any time of day, you can probably roughly estimate what time of day it is, okay? Um, medieval men, though, let's take you back now. Medieval men were rarely aware of which century they were living in, okay? And there was no reason that they should have been aware the century that they were living in um, because there was no way for them to really know. There, there, are, there are great differences between everyday life in 1791 and 1991. Remember that that's when this book was written. But right there, that's a 200-year gap, right? He's saying that in that 200 years, from 1791 to 1991, there are huge differences in how people live their everyday lives. But look what he says about this. He goes, there were very few differences between 791 and 991. That's the same period of time. Both of them are 200 years difference. But the, but, but, in the medieval era, the difference is, is that in that 200 years, there was almost no change at all. And I can think about this from the modern perspective, guys. In the last 10 years, okay, I became a teacher in 2008, all right? 2008, I became a teacher. Since 2008, think about the changes in technology that we've witnessed, the rise of the smartphone and all of the rest of this stuff social media, memes, all of this stuff that has changed so much in just the last 10 to 12 years, okay? That's just 10 to 12 years. We're talking about a 200-year time in the Middle Ages, really longer than that. It's closer to about a 1,000-year time where there is essentially no progress at all, according to William Manchester's argument. Other historians have made counter arguments to this. And they would then be responsible for finding evidence to support that as well. Okay. Life then revolved around different things. Passing of the seasons, cyclical events like religious holidays, harvest time, local feats. In all of Christendom, there was no such thing as a watch, a clock, or apart from the Easter tables at your local church or monastery, anything resembling a calendar. Okay generations succeeded, came one right after the, not the other, um, in a meaningless, timeless blur. In the whole of Europe, which was the world as they knew it, and a world that around which the sun revolved in their minds, they think the sun revolves around us, that's not how it works, obviously, okay? But they don't know anything about North America or South America at this time. They only know Europe, essentially, okay? Um, it says, in the whole of Europe, which was the world, as they knew it, very little happened. Popes, emperors, and kings died and were succeeded by new popes, emperors, and kings. Wars were fought, spoils, meaning the bounties of war, divided up, communities suffered, and then recovered from natural disasters, but the impact on the masses was negligible. And this pattern continued for a period of time roughly corresponding in length to the period of time between the Norman conquest of England in 1066 and the end of the 20th century. We're talking about a period of nearly a thousand years of this motionless, timeless blur. Inertia reinforced immobility. Any, any innovation was inconceivable to come up with new inventions, improvements on existing inventions, to suggest the possibility even of thinking about things from a new perspective, to suggest something that wasn't uniformly believed by all of the Christian believers during this time would have invited suspicion. I told you last week, if we were able to take a time machine back a thousand years to the Middle Ages, I would not even give you probably the week before you've somehow lost your life, either because, you know, of some sort of accident or illness or whatever else, 
The point being that you guys are living in such a different historical context today that you would stick out like sore thumbs in their time. Okay. Um, any innovation was inconceivable to suggest the possibility of one would have invited suspicion. And because the accused were guilty until they had proven themselves innocent, which if you're paying attention, that's the opposite of how we do things in our judicial system. In our judicial system, the way that it's supposed to go is if somebody's accused of a crime, they are presumed innocent until proven guilty by whoever accused them. Okay. That's a very different way of going about law enforcement than this time. This time, you were assumed guilty. If somebody accused you of something, it was your responsibility to prove yourself innocent. The burden rested with the accused, not with the accuser. All right. Um, and then the way that they would go about doing them by making them do some insane trial that almost assuredly would have killed them. Okay. Ordeals by fire, water or ordeals by combat. You're some lowly farmer who's been accused of stealing the nobles' food, and they make you fight against Sir, you know, Gregor Clegane, okay, who's got a massive broadsword and chops you in half. Thus, to be suspect was to be doomed, okay? And this is why it would be so difficult for anyone, myself included, to live in the time that these folks did, okay? So I'm gonna stop there. And then we're going to um, jump past that paragraph onto the next page. And so you can scroll down and I'm starting on this one here where it says, what was it like? Okay. Or what was the world like? Sorry. What was the world like? Okay. Um, what was the world like? And to them, it was the only world round which the sun orbited each day. Uh, when ruled by such men, imagine imagination alone can reconstruct it, re reconstruct it. If a modern European could be transported back five centuries through a kind of time warp and suspended high above the earth in one of those balloons which fascinated Jules Verne, the time traveler, um, he would have scarcely recognized his own continent. Where, he would wonder, looking down, are all the people. Westward from Russia to the Atlantic, Europe was covered by the same trackless forest primeval the Romans had confronted 1,500 years earlier. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo, skip down. One reason the lands east of the Rhine and north of the Danube had proved unconquerable to legions commanded by Caesar in over seven was that unlike the, uh, the other territories he subdued, they lacked roads. The Romans had built roads, which were the same roads, by the way, that the Europeans a thousand years later were using. But now they're all overgrown. They're filled with dangerous highwaymen and people who are going to loot you and rob you. The roads were really, really dangerous. They were dark and, like I say, not well maintained. OK, uh, but there were people there in AD 1500 beneath this deciduous trees canopy, most of them toiling from sun up to sundown, dwelt nearly 73 million people. And although that was less of a tenth of the continent's modern population, there were still enough Europeans to establish patterns and precedents still viable today. 20 million of them lived in the Holy Roman Empire. Um, and then it was, in fact, Central Europe, Germany and her uh, bordering territories was that region that we're talking about. There were 15 million souls in France. So he goes into talking a little bit about the population of France and so on and so forth. And I'm going to kind of skip down because he just kind of is talking about in this next section here on this page, on page uh, 47. He's just talking about populations, urban centers, some of the larger cities in that time. OK, let's skip down to halfway through that page there where it says 20th century urban areas are approached by. So let's say you get on the freeway, you head up, uh, you head up the 15, you hop on the 10, you go all the way over to L.A. The closer you get to, to Los Angeles, the, 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 you know, you're taking this giant super highway and, and it's got these massive skyscrapers the closer you get to L.A. So that's kind of what he's talking about. He says 20th century urban areas are approached by super highways with skylines looming in the background. Back in the olden days in the medieval era, municipalities, cities uh, were far humbler then. Uh, emerging from the forest and following a dirt path, a stranger would confront the grim walls and turrets of a town's defenses. Those would have been typically made of stone. Visible beyond them would have been the gabled roofs of the well-to-do. So they lived in um, kind of these nice homes and the huge square tower of the dungeon, the, the spires of the parish churches and dwarfing them all, the soaring mass of the uh, spires of the 
uh, of the local cathedral. Uh, if the bishop's seat, the bishop is like the local spiritual leader of the Catholic Church in a particular city, uh, was the spiritual heart of the community. The dungeon overshadowing the public square was its secular nucleus, so we're the non-religious center of the city. On its roofs, 24 hours a day, stood watchmen, ready to strike the alarm bells at the first sign of attack, in case your town was being sieged by a local uh, enemy, or fire, because fires broke out a lot during this time. Below them lay the council chamber, where, where local elders gathered to confer and vote. Beneath that, the city archives, and in the cellar, the dungeon, and the living quarters of the hangman, who was kept far busier than any executioner today, because people were punished by death very, very frequently in those days. 16th century men, people, men living in the 1500s, did not believe that criminal character, characters could be reformed or corrected. The idea with prison today, although it's definitely debatable, is that when you send somebody to prison, you're trying to correct their behavior, trying to reform them so that they can become a positive member of society. Never mind the fact that a lot of times when people go to prison, they get out and they commit more crimes. But the idea is it's supposed to be reformatory, not just a death sentence. But back in those days, there's no belief of reforming criminals. Indeed, prisons as we knew, as we know them did not exist back then. Maiming people, harming them, chopping their hands and arms off and other things, and the lash, physical punishments were far more con uh, common. And for convicted felons, the rope was even more common, meaning like... Um, uh, they would hang people. The dungeon was the last line of defense, but it was the wall, the first line of defense, which determined the stuff that happened inside those walls. Uh, the smaller the circumference of the wall, the easier that wall was to construct and build, but the less area you had inside the wall. So imagine building a city and then putting a wall around it. That means your city's not going to really be able to expand too easily because that means you're putting a you're putting a premium on all of the space inside the walls. And as a result of that, the land inside living of uh, in, living inside the wall was uh, invaluable, and not a square inch of it could be wasted. The twisting streets were, streets were as narrow as the breadth of a man's shoulders. Think about a street that's only as wide as a man's shoulders, okay? And pedestrians bore bruises from bumping in with one another. Uh, there was no paving. Shops opened directly onto the street, which were filthy, excrement, urine, offal. Offal is like animal entrails, okay? So like animal guts, the stuff that you don't eat, like you throw the animal guts out, okay? We're simply flung out the windows. It's disgusting. The insides of these cities were extremely claustrophobic. They were extremely dirty. People didn't bathe at this time either very much because um, they had some idea that you could get sick by getting into contact with people who were also sick. So it, what's weird is they understand that illness spreads between people. They get that. They just have no way of explaining how it spreads between people. Um, some people believe it's spirits that, you know, travel from one person to another and then, you know, pervade a person's uh, entity or other people believed it was the smell. We'll talk about the Black Death. All right. But people were filthy because people also understood that this time that to bathe, they didn't have like modern plumbing, right? There were no like sewers or something like that, that people constructed. It was very primitive living that these folks had. And, and so people didn't bathe because there were a lot of waterborne illnesses at the time. So people didn't really drink water because the water was absolutely filthy, okay? And it would have made you very, very, very ill if you ate it or even bathed in it, okay? So people didn't take showers and stuff very frequently because it could make you sick. So they'd rather not risk it and just stay disgusting and dirty and very unhygienic because that was the better of the two options at the time. Now, of course, with the modern COVID situation, all of us understand the pressure to wear masks so that we don't spread illness or um, to wash our hands thoroughly after we, you know, we cough or we use the restroom or something. They had no understanding of any of that, okay? Um, and it was easy to get lost because sunlight rarely reached the ground level because the second story of all the buildings always jutted out over the first story. So to maximize the amount of land, they built up and out a little bit so that you could get a little bit more space, okay? At the top, um, at a height approaching that of the Great Wall, burghers, meaning city folk, could actually shake hands with neighbors across the way because their buildings were so close together. Rain rarely fell on pedestrians, for which they were grateful. 
uh, but little air or light uh, came through either, which they weren't grateful for. Uh, and at night, the town was very scary. Watchmen patrolled it, um, and once clocks arrived, finally, they would be able to call one o'clock and all as well. And then they would drag heavy chains that they stretched across the uh, street entrances to foil the flight of potential thieves. Nevertheless, rogues lurked in dark corners. One neighborhood of winding alleyways may have offered signs for those who could read them that the feudal past was receding. Here were found things like the Butcher's Lane, the Paper Maker Street, Tanner's Row. What he's saying here is, as we get closer and closer to the Renaissance, we begin to see a new class of city dwellers that start to establish themselves as merchants, tradesmen, artisans, people who have some sort of skill, maybe a little bit of wealth. They're not going to be nobles, okay, but they're going to be the beginnings of what we might call a middle class. Okay, and remember, this would have only been a select group of people in cities. Yeah, merchants, okay, merchants, people. But this was a new thing. This only developed at the very, 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 very tail end of the late Middle Ages as we enter into the Renaissance. Um, and then, of course, you may have read about in your book the Medicis, which was the uh, famous banking family of Florence, which helped to fund Renaissance art. Um, and then finally, Germany's century-old Hanseatic Leeds League developed, which we'll talk about later, uh, overtaking the others and for a time dominating trade. So now he's even talking about some economic changes, right? So in Persia, right, economics, right, we can see that the, the focus has shifted a little bit here. But he's talked a lot about intellectual history. He's talked a lot about social history, right? A lot of this stuff is really good for um, practicing some of these skills that we've been using. Okay, that concludes what I want to do for this piece today, but I do want to quickly jump over while we have some time. I need every minute that I can get with you guys this week. So I'm going to have you guys jump over to um, the late Middle Ages PDF. And while you're doing that, actually, while you're pulling up the, uh, that on Canvas, you go to Files, and you click on lecture PowerPoints and you'll see it right in there. It says late middle ages PDF. It's just a PowerPoint that's in PDF format. But while you're doing that, here's what I'm gonna have you type for attendance today. Now, a lot of you I've seen have already typed something and that's fantastic, but do this anyway, just so that I can see it. Why don't you type for me, um, if it was your ideal meal, if you could eat anything that you wanted today for dinner, let's say it's like your birthday dinner or something, and you have your pick of wherever you could go to get whatever you want on the menu, what would you eat? Type that into the box. Ooh, what do we got here? Puffer fish, rice, sushi, sushi, a rack of lamb. Is it Wagyu? I've never had Wagyu before. Uh, fried chicken with baked beans, ramen, probably steak, carne asada fries. Ooh, uh, love to eat sushi made from the, oh man, Theodore. You're talking my language there, man. I would love that. Do you know it takes like 12 years for a sushi chef to become an actual sushi chef in, in Japan? It's like it's a really revered profession. It takes a lot of practice. I would love that, too. Lobster noodles. Good choice. Rice, fettuccine, Alfredo. Ooh, ooh, good choice for food here, folks. You guys are. The other class was like chicken nuggets, you know, like you can have chicken nuggets any day of the week talking about a special meal. All right. <laughs> I'd have fries. I'm just ripping on the other class a little bit. If you like fries, there's nothing wrong with that. It's your choice. You can eat whatever you want. It's your birthday. All right. Now let's move over to this PowerPoint really quickly here. And I'm just going to go over a couple of things before we run out of time. Okay. So uh, pull that PowerPoint up if you have not done so already. And uh, we're going to start at the top slide there. You can see this is kind of what um, an old medieval 
uh, on that first um, slide there, this is kind of what an old medieval city would have looked like, although this one's been developed quite a bit. So you can see a bridge there, but you can see the tower and the gate, right? Very medieval looking, almost kind of looks like if you ever played that game Skyrim um, or any other like medieval era um, role playing game. I play a lot of those because I'm a nerd, um, but uh, it looks kind of like that. OK, you know, very, very similar. Um, and, and remember, like in those games, the roads, they're not paved, you know, they're just dirt roads that lead up to this place. And you've got like different, um, you know, different like little things there, like a tailor or, you know, a tanner or a blacksmith or like people, little merchants that you can go and see, right. Those start to develop right here at the end, just like, uh, of the late middle ages, just like, uh, William Manchester was saying, okay, move on to the second slide there. It says the black death, also known as the bubonic plague. I'm going to move kind of quickly through this stuff, but um, but it is important. The Black Death um, is a is a plague. Now we've been dealing with a pandemic this year in 2020. It's been a pretty wild year, um, and and as deadly and as dangerous as um, as coronavirus has been uh, for the you know modern um, you know modern. Uh, um, people, okay, we'll say, I guess, I don't have a much better word to, to put it, but in modern times, the, the COVID has been dangerous and it's scary for folks. I want you to realize that because we're coming from this in the 21st century, we have a perspective on, on immunology. We have an understanding of how illnesses spread and how they work, okay? Um, so as scary as COVID is, we have some sense of trust that there are people out there um, who who know about this stuff, who are educated, who will be able to come up with solutions relatively quickly to help address the problem of COVID. Imagine living in a time, okay? Imagine living in a time where you have no idea what causes illness and even less of an idea of how to control or stop the spread of it, okay? Um, it, it, these people were living in a pre-scientific era and COVID is deadly. Okay. But COVID's fatality rate, um, applies largely to, and I'm not saying you can't be healthy and die from COVID. Okay. But most of the people who die from the coronavirus, they have other underlying illnesses. Okay. Maybe it's an autoimmune disorder, or maybe they have diabetes or they're, they're, you know, elderly or they have an underlying lung condition or, or whatever it is, okay? There's usually some other complication to their health scenario. You could be fit as a fiddle, get the bubonic plague or even worse, the pneumonic plague. The pneumonic plague was the one that you, it's the one that affects your lungs. It's, it kills you faster and be dead within a number of days, okay? Um, so it's, and when I say that it affected the European population, I'm not talking about one to 2% deaths. We're talking about a 33% roughly, okay, d mortality rate. That means that out of, uh, out of a hundred people that get it, 33 will die. One out of three. That is a huge number. It's a huge, huge, huge number. And it kills a tremendous number of people in Europe. And by the way, it's not the only one. We talk about the bubonic plague because it spread and it, it, it went across Europe and killed massive numbers of people in very short am amount of time, uh, a handful of years. OK, but after that, they were kind of cyclical, seasonally, almost like the flu. Every so often, plagues would come back and kill more people. Now, if you took human geography, AP Human Geo, which I, many of you probably did not, but if you took AP Human Geography, one of the things that they talk about in there is the uh, demographic transition model. And what that is, is it's a way of identifying where places are, where people are in their stage of development. In these times, um, because the death rate was so high for things like plagues, famines, which are like your crops die and everybody starves, um, natural disasters, fires, wars, all sorts of things. The population is really, really vulnerable at this time. And what that ultimately means is that the death rate, the mortality rate for any individual was very, very, very high and people's life expectancies were quite low. However, 
The other thing that's barely, barely higher than the mortality rate is the birth rate. We don't see a lot of population growth in Europe for about a thousand years. The population is kept in check by the amount of people dying from all the things that I just listed for you. People have tons and tons and tons of kids at this time for a couple of different reasons. Number one, the likelihood that your child makes it to adulthood is not guaranteed. These days, barring some sort of traumatic circumstance, people's likelihood once you have a child of that child growing up and making it to adulthood are relatively good thanks to modern medicine, um, immunizations, and various other things. But back in those times, they don't have any of that stuff. And as a result of that, you have to have a whole lot of, um, you have to have a whole lot of, of kids to be able to sustain the population. And two, kids are extra free chore performers, right? If you have a bunch of kids, you can, can send kids out to do all number of different things, milk the cows, churn the butter, do whatever, okay, spin fabric, whatever you assign chores so you have more hands. Remember, they're living in rural areas, right? They don't work in factories or anything at this time. They're, they're working on farms, all right? So you have a bunch of kids and they can go off and do labor, all right? Um, <clears throat> So it, the Black Plague gets spread from rats, illnesses. By the way, in case you're wondering, how come is it that we don't have plagues anymore, Mr. Knight? Well, technically, to be honest with you, the Black Plague, the bubonic plague still exists. And this might surprise you, it actually exists here in America. The thing is, is it's just that people don't really get it anymore. Um, every year, though, or every couple of years, you'll hear a story of somebody who went hiking in like Utah or some remote area of Colorado or something like that. And they end up getting bit by um, like a prairie dog or some sort of other varmint out in the wilderness. And uh, oddly enough, actually, a lot of these um, illnesses are spread amongst animals in like remote areas, and you can still technically get the plague. Difference being today, you're not going to die from it because we have modern medicine. And unlike COVID, which is a virus, viruses aren't affected by antibiotics. You can't go and get penicillin or, or you know, amoxicillin or something to take care of coronavirus. But the plague is a bacterial infection. And uh, so, so um, we have antibiotics today that will kill uh, bacterial infections like that, strep throat and other things like that. Okay. So um, decades of overpopulation. People remember it's a very overpopulated Europe, very crowded living in some of these areas. Um, economic depression, famine, and very bad health made Europeans particularly vulnerable when the Black Death hit. Medicine was extremely primitive at this time. Remember that a lot of the techniques that they would have been using to treat people could have likely actually very much killed them. If you have a fever, probably the last thing that you want to do is turn up the heat in your place because you're already hot. Your body's trying to cool itself down, right? But they would crank the heat up to 170 degrees in a place get a roaring fire going, try and sweat it out of you, bleed you, okay, which of course dehydrates you. It's, it's techniques that probably killed people faster than they did, than it did help people. And on this next slide here, you can see kind of a creepy looking dude in the background, almost looks like a Halloween character or something like that. And he's got one of these long beak masks on. Doctors in this time would frequently wear these long beak masks that they would fill with essentially potpourri. And if you don't know what potpourri is, um, potpourri is like dried herbal incenses and flowers and uh, cinnamon sticks and other stuff like that, that has a pleasant smell to it. It's like very herbal, very floral smelling. And they would fill this, this beak thing with, with this, these floral essences so that when they would go into the places where people had the bubonic plague, that they wouldn't smell. Because what happens when you have the plague is that your body start, your tissue starts to go necrotic. Literally, your tissue is dying while you're still alive, and it's actually extraordinarily painful, and it's a horrible, horrible way to die. And your fingers and your toes turn black and fall off, and you smell like a corpse, okay? And so these doctors would go in there believing that it was the smell that got them sick, and they would breathe in through these large masks with potpourri, thinking that it was offering them protection against, say, like, um, you know, the illness or something. In reality, of course, these aren't N95 masks or anything like that. It didn't offer them any protection. And oftentimes those people who treated the ill uh, would become sick themselves and also die. So how did people live through it then? Pretty much luck. 
The idea being that some people are just born with the right set of immunities to be able to ward off serious illness. Um, even in the modern day time with coronavirus, some people are just not susceptible to it because they have appropriate immune systems to be able to ward off these things before they even feel sick. But nonetheless, they could still technically transmit the illness to others, even though they don't have any symptoms. Okay. Um, and so uh, on the next slide, you've got a map of Europe with a bunch of purple lines. And this, these lines here, if you look at the dates, how to read this map is what this map is telling you, and this is another analytical skill that we're developing here, is the spread of the illness over time. So you can see these dates and the earliest date being down actually over on the, um, uh, essentially the lower part of the screen all the way over to the right actually even because the illness gets brought over by way of Mediterranean trade from the Middle East the Caucasus mountain regions and Ural mountain regions and so on. And these regions uh, had been, uh, the Ottoman Empire and others had been um, facing, uh, uh, mm, what's the word that I'm looking, incursions from attacks from the uh, Mongols. And the Mongols ended up, um, that's good, I'm glad to hear that your mom was able to fight off COVID. I know that that's been a real serious thing. Um, and so the Mongols came, and, and started spreading Black Plague, it went around the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans were trading with Italy. Take a look at where Italy is there. Perfectly positioned in the Mediterranean Sea, centrally located where, where they began to trade with the Ottoman Empire. And also another thing to keep in mind about that, the Ottoman Empire was the thing that possessed all of the um, artifacts from, um, from, from, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, in Rome and across Europe, wherever the Romans had built things, Christians had been tearing that stuff down as symbols of paganism, of, of, of devil worship and other stuff like that. Art was destroyed, sculptures destroyed, buildings destroyed that the, that the Romans had built because the Romans were first, um, were first pagans before they were uh, Christians. And so there was a lot of like idolatry uh, surrounding the Roman gods. And the Christians wanted to erase all of that history and build an entirely new Christian framework of society. It was the Ottomans, the Muslims, who preserved the history. And they tr started to, in the four, late 13, early 1400s, they started to trade a lot with the Italian city-states, Rome, the papal states, right? Uh, Naples, um, and so on. Wait, aren't pagans demonic? No, they really aren't. Pagans were just everyday worshipers of the Christians, they propagandize them as being demonic, as being devil worshipers. To be honest with you, pagans were just everyday Romans who worship the Roman gods, okay? And, and to be honest, I actually know a fair amount about early Christianity and the fall of the Roman Empire. There was a lot of intersectionality, okay? There was a lot of, um, there was a lot of combining, okay, uh, between pagans, Christians, and even Jews during this time, all right? There was, a lot of, um, there was a lot of intersectionality between these different religions because each of them is kind of like, you know, they're kind of all trying to get worshipers and each of them come up with clever ways of um, storytelling and things that, and, and art and so on that allow them to be able to um, uh, work off of one another, if you will. All right, so there's a lot of inter intersectionality there. It's actually a really interesting history. The first few hundred years of Christianity are a very kind of diverse, unusual, different uh, kind of Christianity than we think of in later periods as we get to the Middle Ages. All right, so continuing to move on. Um, all right, let's uh, move down to the Black Death. Okay, uh, one last thing here, because I am running out of time now. What time does this class end? 1036? 1030? I forget what time this class ends. Yeah, well, I think we're out of time. Here's what, guys. I tell you what, the link for period one, I got a little bit farther in period one. Please go on and watch like the last little tail bit of period one. And um, okay, okay, all right, we're done then. We'll, but go on and watch the end of... Um, Watch the end of period one's lecture because there's a little bit more. I go a little bit farther in there. I, I spent a little more time um, talking about the reading with you guys today. Please go on, watch that. I'll be posting um, photos of the reading 
I'll be putting up a PDF of the reading for today and the new questions within the next about uh, 20, 25 minutes or so. And then you can work on that this afternoon for your remote uh, distance learning time. Have a great day, everybody. Enjoy your next class.